and you should be good to go now. Yeah, that's great. Just gonna get the presentation up here. Give me a second. Okay. Now, do I have to mute my microphone, or are you doing it at that end? Uh, yeah. Um, you can just mute and unmute yourself if you'd like, but uh, there's only going to be two or three of us. So, oh, and Elliot's here. Great. We can kick things off then. Okay. All right. So you can hear me, but you can't see me. <laughs> That's right. Okay. All right. So now that we have everyone here, we should be good to get things started. Just uh, let me know if you can't see the presentation on the screen, but otherwise we'll go ahead. Uh, this will be again, planning staff taking it away. Uh, just a few notes from the facilitation end of things. If you have a question at any point, you should see a button at the bottom of your screen that says raised hand. You can also just ask questions at any point in time, but we will have a designated Q and A at the end. That would probably be the best way to manage things. Uh, this is also gonna be streamed on, on YouTube immediately. So as soon as we're done, you can jump back onto YouTube and take a look at the whole thing and, and review any segments that you would like to. Um, with that in mind though, I'm gonna pass things over to planning staff now to, uh, to take it away. Hi, thanks, Mark. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Perfect, thanks. So I'm, I'm super excited and, and really appreciative of the fact that you've taken time to join us today to talk about what I think is one of the most exciting and transformative pieces of planning policy work that our group has, has produced in um, maybe ever, if certainly not uh, ever, maybe in the time that I've been with the city. It is a very important document. It's a long document, which is why we're here today to give you a, pro a presentation that will also be available to people in the public leading up to the special meeting that we have planned of planning committee on June 23rd. So the idea is to try to give people as much time to digest this information, which is why we put the paper out three weeks in advance of the meeting. So looking forward to sharing some high level content with you today, and certainly will be available to take questions after today's session and, and can always follow up with us as well. So the, the purpose of today is really to present to you the power of parking, which is our new discussion paper that we've just released to the public. And it's really fundamentally to start a whole new conversation about parking in Kingston. And hopefully what we want to see is a paradigm shift from what we've traditionally done as a city with respect to managing parking to taking things to a whole new level that really focuses on the, the cost of parking and the interrelationship that parking has to so many other public interest objectives. So we're gonna to talk to you about that today. I'm joined by a few of my colleagues. Laura Flaherty is the project manager for planning services and she's been leading this work as well as the city's new zoning bylaw work. And we're also joined by, by Brent Totteron of Totteron Urban Works. Uh, Brent has been a, a very important consultant that we've been working with over the last couple of years in planning services. And he's been working alongside Laura and I and made some very important and significant contributions uh, to the parking paper that we're gonna talk to you about today. Next slide, please. So I just briefly mentioned why this is important in the context of the city's new zoning bylaw. This is a process we've been going through for several years and we're in phase three right now. So we're getting ready over the next month to release what will be the second draft of the city's new comprehensive zoning bylaw. And parking forms a very important part of that conversation. And because it's so important, we've set up a dedicated conversation and specific paper that really just deals specifically with parking. And that's what we're gonna to talk to you about today. So again, it's really about starting a new conversation as a city with respect to parking and really also a call to action. So of critical importance is the understanding of the interrelationship with parking and the new conversation we want to have, but also the corresponding action that we want to see coming out of the creation of this new planning policy. Really what this paper does is it's, it's meant to fundamentally change the way we discuss and plan for parking as a city it really helps to connect the dots in a really significant way with respect to other city goals. And it frames parking in a new strategic forward thinking way that looks at different approaches that have been happening across the country and also looks at some specific ideas that we have for Kingston. We're not at a decision point. So we're bringing up new ideas as part of this discussion paper and conversation to get feedback on before we move forward with new standards in the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
So I've touched on this briefly already. The city's new zoning bylaw is something that's been a long time in the making. Uh, we've been dealing with multiple zoning bylaws as a city since pre-amalgamation. And really the job is before us now to present a new zoning bylaw for the city that consolidates the five we have. And some of the key things that we've been focusing on are the following three. We wanna harmonize the zoning bylaw, we wanna simplify it, and most importantly, we wanna modernize it. So we wanted to make sure that the public understands this critical conversation that we're having on parking is really in the context of the city's new zoning bylaw. And you will see this conversation roll out over the next couple of months, but we don't intend to actually make the changes in the draft zoning bylaw until we have the final version of it. So it's really important to understand that the version that's coming out, you're not gonna see all of these ideas incorporated in because we're having a public conversation about them now, but the intention is that they will be incorporated into the new zoning bylaw that we're hoping to have passed by council in early 2022. Next slide, please. One of the most important pieces of the paper is really framing what we see as the big parking problem. So what we've seen as a city is that for decades, we've been significantly underestimating the complex costs and consequences of how we address parking as a city and specifically the relationship to our ability to achieve our, our climate change and our environmental sustainability goals, looking at the overall impact with respect to affordability of the city and housing in particular looking at issues of equity, looking at the impact of poorly designed and located parking on urban design and how people experience the city, the impact on public spaces and life overall, and also looking at the intimate, intimate connection that exists between parking and housing viability and the cost of parking and how it impacts good planning projects. Next slide, please. At the onset of this work, we really wanted to make sure that we looked ahead and designed some key parameters so that we would know at the end of this work that we've been successful in achieving our goals. So in framing what success looks like with respect to this new conversation on parking, we've identified the following things. We want the outcome to make sure that the strategy we put forward on, par on parking going forward really demonstrates leadership on climate action. Secondly, we want to ensure that the new parking standards, they support the city's goals associated with housing affordability, active transportation and transit, urban health, social equity, livability and quality of life. We also want to ensure the feasibility of appropriate infill development through the thoughtful development of new parking standards that understands the cost of parking and how it impacts particular projects with respect to our overall growth management strategy as a city. And we also want to make sure at the end of the day, we're coming out with parking regulations that are easy to understand and implement so that we're not creating unnecessary red tape or process. We're actually trying to look at easing the way of development by making regulations, most importantly, that are easy to understand for the public, but also easy to implement. Next slide, please. We also wanted to be really specific up front with saying, you know, as a result of this paper, what won't these proposals do on parking reform? So we wanna be really clear most importantly that what we're discussing right now with respect to new parking standards will not reduce the supply of accessible parking that's available. I know that's of critical concern as we have an aging population and we have a number of people that are differently abled in the city of primary importance to us when we are looking at the creation of new parking standards was to ensure that the supply and design of good accessible parking will not be negatively impact or reduced by way of the new provisions we're considering. We also wanted people to be aware that reducing parking minimums, which is part of the strategy, won't necessarily reduce the overall amount of parking being built. So that's a critical understanding because what that means is that the developer or the builder is going to be deciding how much parking that they essentially build. But to combat that, we're also suggesting that we look as a city as implementing maximums on parking. So again, looking at doing significant reductions in the minimums, and as a city right now, our zoning bylaw only has minimums, but also looking at introducing the concept of parking maximums to ensure that we don't see an oversupply of parking being built. 
We also want to be really clear that the purpose of this work isn't to shift the burden of parking from private properties to municipal supply of parking. So this is really about how we're managing private parking supply in the city on a go forward basis. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it over to Brent. Thank you, Paige. And hello, everyone. Uh, I think we've said in the launch of this work that most parking reports are overly technical. Um, I think that's being generous. I think it's truthful to say that most parking reports, if you've read very many of them, can be described as mind-numbingly boring. But even more importantly, they're often largely disconnected from the actual big city goals, visions, and policies that a city council said they truly believe in. And not only are they often unaligned, they can actually, the parking approach can actually be an, a substantial barrier to the achievement of these big city visions and aspirations. So uh, we're here to have a candid conversation through this exercise on how much parking affects things, but also the opportunities for changing that. And we wanted to start off with this candid conversation by talking about the true cost of parking. Because when we talk about cost of parking, we tend to think and focus about how much it costs per hour to park a car. But the true cost of parking is shockingly expensive. It's often and almost entirely hidden and it's not just a financial cost. It's a cost that goes well beyond uh, just to how much you pay um, in a parking meter. And it starts with the observation, who pays? Everyone. The developers start paying for parking when they design and construct it. But that's just the start of the paying. Higher prices and lower values for everything else. So everyone else pays indirectly. We have residents who pay higher housing prices both rental rates and uh, the amount it costs to purchase a home because of parking. We have consumers paying higher prices for goods and services. We have employers paying higher office rents and employees paying through corresponding lower wages. We have property owners that have their land values reduced because of the parking requirements. We have taxpayers who are paying either more in taxes or receiving less services because of the suck that, that parking uh, has an effect on in terms of municipal finances. And we have all the various costs that are extended costs that are the consequences of, of doing parking wrong. We have the costs of climate change, the public health costs, the large infrastructure costs, the pollution costs, and other opportunity costs because we're essentially all paying for parking and that leaves less money for other good things that we'd really like to accomplish, but we often say we just don't have the money for. So as I've said, many of these costs are not just financial, and, and we really want to make sure that this just isn't an economic conversation, because it's a lot more than just money when we're talking the costs and consequences. Next slide, please. One of the big that needs to be had is about how the cost of parking is not applied equitably. The costs of parking are borne in inequitably. Lower income houses pay more uh, and have a greater uh, impact on the consequences of the cost of parking. They pay more of their overall uh, housing costs on parking than more expensive housing. All parking is very expensive, but in Kingston particularly, the construction of parking is actually even more expensive because of the regional bedrock geology that Kingston is characterized by. So in every city, Parking is shockingly expensive, but even more so here in Kingston. Parking can increase housing costs by, we've said between 2.5% to 25% here. The difference in that range is whether you have one parking space or two. It's 25% or 12.5% or of your housing costs if you have one parking space, 25% of your costs if you have two. So even if we don't uh, get rid of parking altogether, if we just reduce the amount of parking, it has a significant effect on housing costs. Next, uh, next slide, please. Obviously, one of the biggest cost conversations we have to have is the climate emergency. And as Paige noted, uh, uh, Kingston Council has been one of the most early um, um, uh, uh, staters or, or, or um, uh, de declarers of the climate emergency and has inspired many other Canadian and Ontario cities to do so. The transportation sector just by itself uh, represents 36% of 
Kingston's existing GHG emissions. And by the way, that's the math you get when you include things like how much meat we eat, uh, how much we fly. When you actually focus just on the uh, elements of GHG emissions that are specifically under the city's control, the percent is, is even higher. And for interest, the actual percentage Canada-wide is 23%, uh, whereas Kingston's is, is 36%. So it shows that Kingston actually has a disproportionate greater amount of its overall GHG emissions that come from transportation. Next slide, please. And here's a big message. It's not just about what comes out of the tailpipe of the vehicle when we're talking about uh, the, the, the climate emergency. We know that pollution is a lot more than just greenhouse gases. You have pollution particles that, uh, that come from brake and uh, uh, tire dust, which we know scientifically there's no safe limits for and have a significant effect not only on pollution, but preventable health issues that come from uh, pollution uh, affecting not only all people, but particularly kids. So there is pollution that comes from uh, cars that isn't just about what comes out of the tailpipe. And, and those consequences come whether the vehicle is an electric vehicle or a fossil fuel powered vehicle. Similarly, the construction consequences for the climate change are massive. The amount of concrete and steel and asphalt that goes into accommodating not only the parking con construction itself, but all the roads uh, that feed that parking is massive. As a matter of fact, globally, 5% of all the greenhouse gas emissions comes just from the creation of concrete. And another 5% comes just from the creation of steel. So when you're having to construct a great deal more building because you're constructing all that parking, it has significant uh, greenhouse gas emission consequences, whether your electric vehicle or your vehicles are electric or fossil fuel based. Next slide, please. We really have to do a better job aligning our parking strategy with our broader aspirations and indeed our broader successes in Kingston around active transportation and public transit specifically. And Kingston is, is, a, is a Canadian leader in recent uh, gains and, and successes in public transportation specifically, but the parking strategy not only is not aligned with that, but often is actively standing in the way of those achievements and leveraging the city's significant and strategic investment in active transport and public transit. So bringing these two strategies together for the first time, frankly, uh, will be able, will allow the city to be able to see much greater success in the areas in public transit. Next slide, please. It's often said that when we're designing projects, when we're designing buildings, when we're designing communities, parking is often laid out first because of how rigid and strict it is and, and un immovable it can be in the usual approval processes before the, even building, before the buildings are even designed. And that leaves not much space and not much flexibility or creativity for the designing of frankly everything else. We know that when we actually take less space for parking, it leaves more space for everything else we're trying to achieve, both physically and, and aspirationally, all the other th things we're trying to achieve uh, for, through better design of our communities, our sites, our buildings, et cetera. And that supports everything from project viability to better public space and better public life. Next slide, please. So here's one of the key points. Uh, when it comes to the actual amount of parking, we know through studies that excessive parking supply actually encourages or induces car ownership. In other words, if you've got the parking spaces, you tend to fill them up. You tend to purchase more vehicles. And we know, we've known through studies how incredibly powerful that inducement actually is. And then once you own more cars, you tend to drive them more. Car, increased car ownership in, induces more actual driving. So we know that the solution can't primarily be just better cars, even electric vehicles. The first goal has to be fewer goals and less driving from a public policy perspective. Because we know that if we transformed 
all the vehicles in Kingston into electric vehicles overnight. There would be a benefit to that, but it would not be enough because there are many consequences, not just in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, to still having too many vehicles, too much space being taken up, too much greenhouse gas emissions from the construction of parking and streets and roads, et cetera. So the first goal has to be fewer cars and less driving strategically as a public policy objective. Then the second goal becomes for the, for the reduced amount of parking that results, how do we facilitate the transformation of those, those remaining cars and vehicles into electric vehicles as opposed to fossil fuel burning vehicles? Next slide, please. To state the obvious, we're crafting this policy and having this discussion while still in the midst of a global pandemic. It's uh, an understatement to say that we're looking at everything we're doing in this strategy and everything in the, re in the zoning bylaw through the lens of not just the pandemic itself, but the economic recovery that will follow uh, to make sure that, frankly, all of our moves align with and actually support that economic recovery. But it's really important to say that we faced many challenges that we've already talked about, affordability challenges, climate crisis challenges, et cetera, before the pandemic, uh, started. We're facing them during the pandemic and we will face those challenges after the pandemic. And there's even a chance that those challenges will get worse because of the actions we take as a result of the pandemic. So it's very important that we think strategically about the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic, but make sure that we're not making our existing crises even worse as a result of our strategies. Just one example of how we've applied that lens in many cases, more progressive parking strategies have considered the idea of a parking maximum for commercial and retail space. In other words, shopping centers and, and retail stores. And it's, tr it's true that one of the largest places where there can be easily be excessive parking is in those big parking lots and shopping malls. But because of the unprecedented uncertainty in the retail sector right now as a result of the, the pandemic and the need to make sure that we position that sector well going into the economic recovery, we are not proposing any parking maximums for commercial or, or retail. And that's an example of how we've applied the pandemic lens, if you will, and the need for a strong economic recovery to all of our strategic recommendations. Next slide, please. It's safe to say that we've been educated and inspired by not only what every city in Ontario has done in the context of their parking strategies and parking studies, but we've had meetings and conversations with some of the most progressive and, and, and forward thinking cities around a new approach to parking, Edmonton, Toronto, Vancouver, but lest you think we're, we're talking just about big cities. And the truth is we will be one of the first mid-sized or smaller cities that has this kind of conversation. We have been very inspired by everything that has been done specifically in smaller cities and Ontario specific cities. But it's also safe to say that we've striven to make sure that we're not only inspired by those cities, but that what Kingston does in this moment can actually inspire other cities do, and particularly medium and smaller cities, because frankly, there are a lot more medium and smaller cities across Canada and Ontario than there are large cities like Toronto. So Kingston has a rare leadership opportunity to be a real inspiration to a whole scale and vintage of other cities across Canada around rethinking how we do parking. So next slide, and I'll hand it over to Laura, our project manager. Thanks, Brendan. Hello, everyone. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that we are not presenting recommendations and our minds are not made up. We've been very deliberate in our language, which refers to the initial preferred options and also includes some other options that can be considered. What we really want to have is an unprecedented, connected and candid conversation with everyone having a broader understanding and view of the implications, costs and consequences of parking. Then we want to discuss the ambitious proposals that we've put forward as the initially preferred approach or initially preferred options in the discussion paper. The intent of the paper is to start a bold new public conversation. Our final recommendations will come later when the recommendations are made on the overall new zoning bylaw project, which we are anticipating in early 2022. Next slide, please. 
The first initially preferred option in the discussion paper is the where. We recognize that not all areas of the city of Kingston are equal when it comes to transportation choices other than driving. Some areas of the city are served by a more compact built form with a mix of uses in a highly walkable environment. Some areas have excellent access to more frequent transit service, and some areas are traditionally more car oriented in their form and fabric. We are most able to reconsider traditional approaches to parking in places where other good transportation choices exist. The initially preferred option includes a location-based approach, which recognizes the downtown and Williamsville areas, areas well served by express transit routes, and the remainder of the city as having different transportation choices that are worthy of distinction in parking policy. Next slide, please. Put simply, parking minimums are the minimum number of parking spaces required for various buildings and uses. One of the most common problems associated with parking minimums is that they are generally applied and often result in an oversupply of parking that may end up underutilized most of the time. As Brent has identified earlier, excessive parking can actually induce more car purchases and car use since the space is easily available. When talking about parking minimums for residential uses, they are typically connected to the number of residential units on a property. The initially preferred option uses the location-based approach with some areas subject to modest reductions and other reductions that are more transformative and significant. Generally speaking, the option represents a reduction as low as 20% and as high as 60% when compared to the existing residential parking requirements in the city. Next slide, please. In recommending parking minimums, there are two specific scenarios that we have treated differently. The preferred option includes the complete removal of parking minimums for heritage properties and for affordable housing developments. This is the most significant change in parking minimums identified in the paper, representing 100% reductions from the current requirements. It reflects our strong interest in making things easier and more flexible in these two areas. We think this will be an important move for heritage conservation and reuse in the city and will allow for affordable housing providers to choose how many parking spaces to provide relative to the nature of the plant, planned housing. Next slide, please. When it, comes to convert, when it comes to commercial parking, our favored option is to strategically lower commercial parking minimums so that one common ratio applies to different types of commercial uses. This approach would remove a lot of the red tape currently experienced when changing from one commercial tenancy to another. For example, restaurants have historically been required to provide more parking than retail stores. This causes administrative issues when changing from one commercial business to another. The favored approach would eliminate these issues and would allow for existing commercial buildings to easily change commercial tenants. Overall, the commercial minimums favored by the paper would position Kingston as one of the most progressive municipalities in Ontario. Next slide, please. It's important to note that the removal or reduction of parking minimums doesn't necessarily result in less parking as Paige indicated earlier. With minimums alone, developers have the ability to provide as much parking as they want, as long as it's more than what the minimum is requiring. Parking minimums are the strongest way to prevent the excessive oversupply of parking and one of the most important innovations considered within the paper. As Brent indicated earlier, at this time, we are only considering maximums for multi-unit residential properties and have not identified commercial or other non-residential maximums. Next slide, please. While the overall intent is to reduce the number of parking spaces, it also seeks to ensure that there's no reduction in the supply of accessible parking spaces. The paper has identified new ways to ensure the supply of accessible spaces is maintained and in some instances exceeds the current supply requirements. The paper also suggests some strategic adjustments to the design requirements of accessible spaces, better aligning with the provincial AODA standards while addressing some of the observed challenges. Next slide, please. So based on what I've said so far, you might be asking why we don't just get rid of minimums altogether. This is an option that we have considered extensively in writing this paper and is an option that's specifically identified in the paper. Ultimately, the initially favored option is to continue to require lowered parking minimums for various uses and create a framework in the new zoning bylaw that allows for incentives to be used to help to achieve other public interests that support less parking. Incentives included in the paper would allow for the parking minimums to be reduced if certain facilities are provided, such as car share parking spaces, enhanced bike parking facilities, and electric vehicle supply equipment. Next sli slide, please. 
So we've identified new enhanced bike park parking opportunities that can either be required in the zoning bylaw or included as an incentive in the zoning bylaw provided in exchange for a lowered parking minimum. Starting with the potential requirements, we've identified a potential minimum bike parking ratios for residential, commercial, industrial, and recreational uses. The minimums are further broken down into short-term and long-term bike parking spaces. The intent of the short-term spaces are to provide spaces that can be easily accessed by customers or visitors to a property, whereas long-term bike parking spaces are intended to be provided for owners, residents, or employees who have access to more secure facilities such as shared bike parking rooms with bike racks. Next slide. We've also identified requirements to provide end of trip facilities, which would include showers, changing rooms and closed lockers for non residential uses. This innovation is intended to provide facilities for cyclists who ride their bike to their place of work. Bike theft is a major issue affecting cyclists and would be cyclists in the city. Even long-term bike parking spaces, which result in bikes being stored in shared bike rooms, provide potential bike theft opportunities. We've identified a requirement to provide enhanced bike security measures for certain percentage of the bikes, which would result in individual bike lockers being provided for extra security. Finally, a new trend is seen in increase in larger bikes, including accessible bikes, cargo bikes, and bike trailers. Initially, our initially favorite option includes a small percentage of larger bike spaces to recognize and support this trend. Next slide, please. Beyond the requirements, the initially favored option includes a number of potential incentives for enhanced bike parking. These incentives would allow for a further reduction of the minimum parking requirement in exchange for additional standard or larger bike spaces, additional bike lockers, e-bike spaces, weather protection for short-term bike spaces and bike maintenance areas. Next slide. As far as the design requirements are concerned, the paper outlines the need to meet certain bike sizes with appropriate bike racks that allow bikes to be secured with a lock. The initially favored option has built in flexibility, recognizing different formats of bike racks, such as horizontal, vertical, or the stacked bike spaces seen in the photo. The different formats would allow more efficient use of the long-term storage rooms while maintaining the functionality and easy use of the bike storage solution. Next slide, please. So moving on to car sharing, car sharing is uh, essentially a car rental service where members of the public or members of the car sharing organization can easily book cars for shorter or longer intervals of time. So car share vehicles are typically parked in strategic locations in a city where they can be easily accessed by car share members. Car sharing has been found to be key in reducing not only vehicle use, but vehicle ownership as well. The paper identifies an opportunity for the zoning bylaw to include incentives where the minimum parking requirement would be reduced by five spaces for every one car share parking space provided. This would ultimately form part of a larger strategic effort to achieve a broader car share market for Kingston. Next slide, please. In some scenarios, such as the car share parking spaces, we've included a very specific incentive. When it comes to electric vehicle supply equipment, there are many complexities to consider, including whether the requirements are permitted under the existing provincial legislation. When we talk about EVSE, there are two different elements to consider from a zoning perspective. The first is the actual installation of the charging station and all of the electrical infrastructure necessary to support it. And the second is a construction approach that would allow for the easy installation of supply equipment in the future. Other municipalities have referred to this as a conduit where space has been allocated for future electrical installation. We've not provided a favored approach for EVSE in the paper. This is a place where the conversation is ongoing, whether it should be incentives or requirements or both. We are continuing our legal due diligence and consultation with stakeholders who have direct experience to ensure that the recommended approach meets all objectives and is aligned with the ongoing development of the city's green standard community improvement plan. Next slide, please. There are a number of other equally important topics in the paper that we have not highlighted in the presentation, just in the interest of time. The paper includes improved uh, approaches to dimensions for both parking and loading spaces. It also introduces potential new shared parking provisions that would allow for different uses on the same property to share their minimum parking space requirements. We're happy to answer questions and provide additional details about these topics as well. As described earlier, this work is part of a, oh, sorry, next slide, please. <laughs> 
As described earlier, this work is part of a larger new zoning bylaw project. The next step in the parking discussion paper is the public meeting on June 23rd at 6 p.m. at a special meeting of planning committee. We hope everyone comes out to participate in this exciting conversation. Next slide, please. With that, I'd like to open the question and answer portion of this meeting. Thank you. All right, um, Jessica, Bill, feel free to just uh, go ahead with questions, I guess, at this point. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, thank you for the presentations. It's a lot to digest. <laughs> um, let me see here. Uh, okay, so um, this, this proposal only focuses on private parking, correct? So municipal parking lots, street parking, this is, has nothing to do with or very little. Who can explain that? I guess I can jump in here. So yes, exactly. So the zoning bylaw really regulates the parking on privately owned properties. Uh, city properties that like say one of the city owned buildings like 1211 John Counter Boulevard, which has a parking lot for a city facility would be regulated by a zoning bylaw, but uh, city owned parking on, on street. So where you have parking meters on the side of the street is not covered by the city zoning bylaw. Okay, so the city was going to uh, build a multi-level parking garage downtown. Um, would this strategy impact that at all? Um, or, or would it be different then? So as far as the the city supply um, provided in a parking structure. Certainly the zoning bylaw would not dictate how many parking spaces the city is intending to provide. It would impact elements of the actual functional design of like the size and, and the size of the parking space and the size of the drive aisle. But as far as the actual planned parking structure itself, is, that's not covered by the this parking strategy. Okay. I could just jump in there, uh, Bill. Just the other thing that uh, we're, we have in some of the initial recommendations is getting rid of the city's cash in lieu of parking um, uh -huh. program and bylaw. That's been in place for a long time. And essentially what happens in that circumstance, and this only applies to the downtown area, is that if you don't have the ability to provide on street parking um, in, or sorry, if you don't on-site parking in, uh, in a particular development, you can enter into an agreement with the city for a certain amount of money per space. And then the city basically agrees to be able to provide that space in exchange for the money. We're, as part of this work, we're suggesting that we repeal that bylaw and get rid of it altogether so that the city's no longer participating in trying to facilitate parking spaces for private development, that that gets figured out solely by uh, the applicant or developer in, a, you know, in context of the new provisions we're suggesting. Okay, so giving developers essentially free reign to decide how many spaces they want to put um, beneath uh, an apartment or a condo building. Um, would that, could that backfire in, in the sense that you, you, they'd say, well, you know what, if, if you want to park here, uh, you, you can park on the street now. Would that put more pressure on residential streets to accommodate the parkers who live in nearby buildings because there isn't enough space for the for the building it's, uh, itself and the building footprint, it spill out onto the streets around it. I think generally, Bill, that's and I'm happy to start. Laura and Brent, feel free to jump in here. Um, I think generally that is a fear that most people hold as we look at like strategizing and shifting the way that we look at parking, reducing minimums significantly. Um, and, and leaving it up to the individual property owner to, as long as they're providing the minimum, figure out what their parking needs are. There's always the worry that it's going to spill over into the, the public right of way. So the intention would be if that happens, that really becomes a parking enforcement issue where we, where we have people parking in spaces that typically maybe they're part of like commuter parking or where you require a permit. So we're definitely having those conversations with the transportation services group that's responsible for that policy portfolio. But it's certainly, you know, not something that the city would be like tolerating, allowing cars going everywhere. It, uh -huh. it, that would really need to be dealt with by the enforcement end of things. Lauren and Brent, I don't know if you have any other further comments on that. I do, Laura, do you? <laughs> Go ahead, Brent. 
Sure. Um, well, uh, part of the answer is uh, relates to Laura's slide about one size not fitting all. Uh, it's important to remember that we're not getting rid of the, or not at least recommending the getting rid of the parking minimums entirely. And, and even the level of reduction has had regard to the context, the physical context of different places. Um, and this is where there's even a possibility of what you're talking about. Um, we're, we're treating differently than places where there is a lot less of a possibility of what you're talking about. So we factored that fear, that, that possibility into our geographic approach uh, to the parking minimums. Uh, but I'll say this even more importantly, it's in our experience looking at other cities that have done this, uh, what has manifested, what has been realized is very few actual buildings that, that under provide for parking because it is in a project's best interests to figure out what parking they actually think they need, uh, not only for the operation of the building, but for the marketing of the building. And they tend to provide that amount. Uh, and so only in cases where a project is specifically being uh, conceptualized and marketed as a low car building, do you see cases where developers uh, may take full advantage of the flexibility and do a very low parking scenario. And typically, again, those buildings build right into their uh, approach, um, uh, facilities like car share, enhanced bike facilities, et cetera. And our strategy facilitates that. So what, we, what we've seen in other cities that are ahead of Kingston on this is there hasn't been a localized parking problem. Uh, if there is, it's easily managed through uh, enforcement uh, mechanisms. And um, what we tend to see is, is actually that um, uh, people reconsider when they're choosing a particular place, whether they need at least one, or at least two vehicles, let alone even one vehicle. And it becomes a decision in whether or not they take part in, in, in that particular building. So it, it's a good question to ask. We've done a lot of investigation on what cities that are ahead of us have seen and learned. And uh, we're confident that the way that uh, we've conceptualized the problem and the management of the issue uh, will make sure that it's not an issue. Okay. So those are for buildings we're talking about. What about driveways in residential areas in the suburbs, which you often see crammed with three or four SUVs as it is? Uh, you're talking about uh, new home construction with much smaller driveways now? Uh, so the the requirements for the lower density residential are not expected to change significantly from the existing requirements. So we aren't proposing any kind of parking maximums for the low density residential. We're also specifically accounting for some of the historic um, parking enforcement issues that have been happening within those lower density neighborhoods where a uh, driveway might actually be less than six meters in length. So what we're proposing to do through this work is to include a different parking size requirement for those low density uses to ensure that we don't have the same types of enforcement issues that we that we have had historically. So I think overall, we're not proposing any parking maximums uh, within those low density residential. And I think what we're actually doing is trying to proactively accommodate for some of the issues that we've had in the past in those lower density residential areas. Okay, so given those answers, what is then your biggest fear uh, with this bold vision? What could cause it to fall flat? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start. Um, where I give Kingston credit for this, and I've, I've observed and seen this exercise uh, uh, attempted to be undertaken in many cities, including beyond even Canada, is, is a failure to consider um, um, unforeseen consequences. And, an, and the most common example of an unforeseen consequence when you allow for less parking is a reduction in uh, accessible parking, for example. There's probably three or four, but that's probably the one that has most commonly caused significant issues in the public discourse and also significant issues in the implementation. So what we've done through this exercise is learn from uh, the, the, the things that have gone wrong in other places, the things that would be our initial fear based on your question, and try to be pro 
proactively with a good spider sense about it, proactively uh, uh, address that issue in, in, a, in, a, in a way rather than let it become a big issue and then retroactively try to address it. So I give Kingston a significant credit compared to other cities that I've seen do this. There's been a lot of upfront thinking, proactive thinking about the things we would normally be afraid of. And instead of just being afraid of them, but hoping for the best, proactively addressing them in this strategy. And you see that um, in the way that, uh, in what this document uh, contains, that frankly, I have seen most other planning documents not contain, not address at all. Hmm. Okay, that's one, that's one issue then. So accessible parking, what else? Anything else you're afraid of? If I could, if I could step in there. Um, I, and I wouldn't say that I'm afraid of it, Bill, but I think um, something that we've been very conscious about is, you know, this rec record, this would represent significant change for Kingston. And sometimes we're a city that isn't overly comfortable with change. And because parking in zoning are things that typically are very technical and the average person um, you know, either doesn't have the time or the interest to engage in. Our biggest concern is making sure that people really understand the critical connections here and also what we're actually talking about in terms of initial preferred options so that we can have that meaningful conversation to ensure that when we get to a decision point with council that we've had the opportunity for people to get comfortable with what we're trying to do, understand how it connects to the broader goals that our community and council has set for itself, and then to really have confidence with moving forward with something that is going to require some change and behavioral change from what we've traditionally done as a city, but in a way that helps us to achieve all of the aspirations or significantly contribute to some of the aspirations we've set. So for me, it's, it's not a fear. It's always um, with planning, how to, how to walk people that have all different interests through something that's incredibly technical, but have them understand the pieces to give you the critical feedback and to build collective um, support for what we wanna do to help council make this decision. Right. One of my colleagues, uh, after reading the, the news release on this, uh, said, oh, great, now I'm going to have to carry my lumber home on Kingston Transit from Home Depot because, they won't let me, you know, they're reducing parking there. So maybe you can just clar <laughs> maybe you can just clarify for existing businesses that already have those sprawling parking lots, uh, which a lot of them are empty now because of the lockdown. Um, maybe you can clarify what exists right now will not change or will it? Or is this just simply for or solely for future development? So zoning bylaws don't get applied retroactively. So we can't force existing properties to change anything that's already there. So unless uh, Home Depot or any other commercial um, business wanted to proactively reduce the number of parking spaces that as a result of this work. Um, I don't anticipate there to be many changes. I would say that uh, commercial tenants are the they recognize the benefit in having spaces, especially um, the larger home improvement type stores. So I don't anticipate that they would be the ones who would be jumping the gun to remove their parking spaces because it, <laughs> it is beneficial to them to continue to offer that service to their customers. Yes, I will let my colleague know uh, that they don't have to take their two by fours onto the bus uh, to to get I, to get home. Can I just add? And I appreciate the 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 the, the blunt anecdote from your colleague. Uh, I've been at this for almost thirty years, and I've been hearing the uh, line about taking lumber on a bus for about thirty years. Yeah. Uh, it, it's remarkable how that narrative, to be to, to be completely candid can can really take over a public conversation. One of the reasons we're being so candid and blunt is we wanna tell the truth and make sure that myth and misinformation doesn't dominate this public discourse. So let's be really clear. There's still gonna be a lot of parking for your lumber. There is nothing in this exercise that is expecting or anticipating uh, that kind of transformation. What it will prevent is when you're walking to your vehicle with your lumber or riding, uh, moving your cart along with it, you won't be going through or seeing a sea of empty parking spaces on the way to or just past your vehicle. And that's the truth of the existing condition. 
we have significantly overbuilt parking um, and we're talking about retail right now, and 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 that's one thing. But uh, with, with we've significantly overbuilt all kinds of parking in our city with significant costs and consequences. So we can have a rational conversation about how to stop the excessive oversupply of parking without getting anywhere near a situation where there won't be any parking. If you see what I mean. So yeah. I think it's really important to make sure that the public understands what's being proposed and not proposed. Yeah. No, I, I understand what you're saying there. Uh, it's just that, yeah, we're seeing extreme examples, including in your slide presentation, where, of course, uh, yeah, everything's locked down now. So, of course, parking lots are going to look vast and empty. But I also see the malls at Christmas where they're jammed and there's not enough parking. So I guess it's how to find that that happy that happy medium, right? Uh, the supply and demand uh, of it all. But I want to focus on affordable housing for a second here. So you say this should spur more affordable housing, and, and how do you see that exactly? Um, I'm happy to start and then have other people to, to jump in. Of course, given you know where we are as a city with respect to affordable housing, it's one of our most critical priorities. And although we've seen significant increase in the supply of housing overall over the last couple of years, and, and the city returned to a, a healthier vacancy rate than it's seen in uh, many years previous to where we are right now, we still have a significant gap on the housing continuum in terms of the supply at different levels of affordability that's required to meet our current demand. So we've given this a lot of thought as part of this work. And again, on, on the costing part of understanding what that brings to a project and understanding um, those pieces so specifically that could funnel into this work. And, and that's where you know, the reductions down to zero for, for um, affordable housing and heritage projects are so important because that aspect alone, adding that into a project can very easily make it unviable or it can reduce the number of units that could be achieved on the property, which would have maximum benefit for the community to build parking spaces that actually are only being utilized or partially utilized um, at part of the time. So that has been a key consideration. What we're, we're hoping to see if this approach, if the community is able to support it and counsel is that we'd be reducing the overall significant cost of the development process, which is the construction and long-term maintenance of parking for affordable housing projects in particular, to be able to ensure that the dollars that are going towards affordable housing are actually going into the creation of units, not partially into the creation of units and then partially into the creation of parking spaces, which sit empty most of the time. Right. Um, and how can you uh, guarantee then, because another point you raised was about, you know, uh, the extra costs of parking are being added on to, you know, homes and, and rents and that kind of thing. How can you guarantee that, that a developer will pass those savings on to a tenant from not supplying any parking? Well, I'll take a shot of that. First of all, uh, as we as we explain, the costs and consequences are a lot more, or the cost savings are a lot more than just to a developer. This is not about just saving developers money. This is about saving all of us money, and that's actually part of the big realization we have to have when we understand what we call the power of parking. Having said that, uh, it's it's. The parking component of a housing cost is often a hidden cost. People don't even often know how much the parking space actually costs when they're paying the rent or paying um, their purchase price. But invariably, when parking is taken out, the market value, uh, perceived market value of that project goes down. Uh, and uh, correspondingly with the costs. And developers don't mind that because it all nets out evenly. So, um, so. The, the, the answer to your question is the municipality has zero power to guarantee or even regulate in any way what, what the marketplace charges for rents uh, or, or for purchase prices. But what has been seen based on, on basic supply and demand and, and the way the marketplace works is that when parking is reduced, price goes down. And it goes down because even if the developers wanted to still keep paying higher prices, they couldn't necessarily get them based on uh, basic issues of supply and demand. I'm just wondering if, if we should go to Jessica. Do you have any questions? You haven't had a chance to, to offer anything yet. I'm actually fine. Bill is asking all the right questions. So 
I might pop in at the end if there's anything else, but so far so good. <clears throat> okay, um, I don't want to take too much more time here because uh, <laughs> um, other things we got to get to here today, but um, so would you see this policy benefiting developers more than than any other sector? I, for one, um, I've been a city planner for almost 30 years. I've, I've been chief planner of Vancouver. I've been a planner for Calgary. I've spent about half my career in the public sector and the private sector. And I can say definitively that the purpose for doing a policy approach like this is because it benefits everyone. Uh, I think actually from a, from a net perspective, um, what I've seen on the private sector side is, is it's going to come across as relatively neutral or close to neutral because while you're saving costs, you're also, it's also reducing perceived market value of your product or your rent rates. But what it does allow you to do, which is a big advantage for um, uh, developers and builders, is it gives you more flexibility. Uh, particularly when you're laying out and designing your, your, your levels of underground parking or what have you, where you don't suddenly find yourself in a long process because you can't quite fit enough parking on, a, on one tray of parking mm -hmm. without going to a second tray um, uh, while still meeting the, the pretty high parking minimums that the city has, has created. So that flexibility, that nimbleness, the ability to make small adjustments is we're going to be where the big be benefit, I think, is for developers. I actually think uh, from a city planning perspective that the public interest achievement of this is much more significant. I'll say with, a, with, 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 with specific candor that no city can um, say with a straight face, a strong interest in, in doing better on the climate emergency, better on affordability, better on infrastructure costs, better on public health, better on social equity, while not addressing the elephant under the table, which is their own parking strategy. So this is, from my perspective, largely about unlocking the greater public interest opportunity that, that is achievable once you're not hamstrung by your own parking strategy. Uh, it'll have the benefit of, 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 of benefiting developers with greater flexibility, but there's a strong public interest benefit to that too because it, it's, it leads to the actual kind of housing that will strengthen your downtown, the transfer more, uh, the restoration and preservation of your heritage projects, the achievement of greater affordable housing, et cetera. So this is a public interest move from my perspective. Okay. Um, can somebody just comment uh, finally on the height issue? Uh, we've seen a lot of controversial projects downtown, the Capital or Crown Condo project. We see the Homestead, uh, both have been before the LPAT. Those projects uh, specifically are based on large uh, parking podiums. Um, so do you see this policy as perhaps shrinking the size of uh, the height of uh, buildings because they won't need so much parking at the base or in the ground? Um, do you see that happening at all? I can start, I, I, I don't wanna hog the time here, but. I mean, I, I definitely think it can it can make a contribution towards that bill. So if if you're not having uh, additional parking being built that takes up space, whether it's subgrade or within the podium, for sure, there's greater space for other active uses, uh, whether for they're for the building or they're for commercial uses at grade or for additional units. So I think that's that's an element that that can be positively positively impacted by this for sure. I mean, the two different projects you've referenced have vastly different parking ratios anyway, speaking to different markets. So where I think um, some of the more impactful piece is some of the, the contemplation that we've put in with respect to the um, implementation of parking maximums, where uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're not seeing excess parking uh, being built in the downtown where there's more walkable options. So of that piece, I see that being more impactful with some of the thoughts that we've put together in the initial recommendations. But certainly, you know, the, the reorganization and the design of buildings and space becomes completely different when you reorient your whole way of thinking about parking. So it's, you know, space at grade that otherwise would have been occupying uh, parking could be facilitated into greater amenity space for the users of the building, greater green space, 
um, active spaces for the community. So th there's so many opportunities that come with this. Um, it's certainly not aimed at anything related specifically to building height, but it, it does transform the way that buildings can be designed and, and spaces utilized within the city and the parking maximums in particular, I think, are a really important part of the discussion that we're trying to have and, and part of what we expect to hear some feedback on. I'll just add that it's really important to remember a couple of things. First of all, it's far more likely that the, this innovation is going to have the effect of not having very many homes that have no cars. It's far more likely that it will result in more homes that have two cars instead of three, one car instead of two. Uh, and there is a lot of public benefit in that reduction, uh, where even if some of the household trips are through walking, biking, and transit, not necessarily all of them. So um, any narrative that this is pushing towards no car households, that's, that's, that's not what's been borne out uh, when this innovation comes. What it, what, it, what it results in is not excessive parking forced um, uh, on by the city itself through its own excessive parking uh, expectations or, 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 or minimums. Secondly, um, I'd say that in terms of your question, it will be, as Paige said, it will be other exercises that determine how big a building is too big, how tall a building is too tall, but you happen to have a pretty specific, it's not unique to Kingston, but it is rare, where you have a problem where a lot of your above ground building is actually being taken up by parking. And if you're gonna have a big building, what I always say is the worst thing you can uh, have making up that big building is parking. Because if you're going to have a big building, you might as well at least get homes in that building. But you've got a lot of that mass that people are so concerned about actually taken up by parking. So whether other exercises will determine whether buildings are too tall or too big, what this will help with is making sure that the building size and building height that you get is actually hopefully more filled up with actual homes. Because that's the actual purpose of a building, to house people not house cars. Well, thank you very much for the insight, the information, a lot to, again, to digest. And uh, I guess I look forward to the, uh, the public uh, meeting coming up uh, later this month. So thank you again. We do have a question now. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Yep. Go ahead, Jessica. Uh, I was just wondering what I'm, maybe I missed it in the uh, media release, but like, what are you hoping to get out of the planning meeting that's going to include the public? Good question. So obviously the way that we've presented the parking paper is really ideas and options for consideration. So we're looking for any feedback that any members of the public have related to parking, like no feedback is wrong. So um, anything that the public feels is relevant and connected to what we're looking at doing through the new zoning bylaw project, we're certainly looking for that type of feedback. So no, no comment or idea is too small and, and we want everyone to feel welcome and and invited to come out and participate in, in the public conversation. Um, planning committee meetings are held on the Zoom platform. So it is really easily accessible to most people during the pandemic. It's not like you need to attend in person to provide your feedback. And certainly um, if members of the public don't feel comfortable uh, attending and, and giving comments in a Zoom format, uh, we can have uh, comments submitted in writing via email or over the phone as well. Okay, and are you going to do like a little presentation like you've done here for their informational sake first? Yes, yeah, so at the public meeting, we'll also do a very similar presentation to the presentation that we just did. And this uh, presentation will be available uh, on the city's YouTube channel. So people who aren't able to attend the public meeting can also access this information there as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks again, folks. Oh, thank you very much, Jessica and Bill, for coming out and being part of uh, today's yeah. session. And certainly, we know it's a lot of information, which is why we're trying to get it out there with weeks of time for people to digest. But certainly, if either of you have any follow-up questions or you dig into some detail and you need some clarity, reach out to us at any point. We're always happy okay. to have a follow-up conversation. All right. Sure. Appreciate that.
you take care, everyone, and uh, we'll talk soon, hopefully, okay? Thanks, all. All right. Okay, bye-bye.